Hello, and welcome to the University of Alberta's Opening Up Copyright Instructional Module on the CCH case. Libraries are valuable sources of copyright protected resources, and as part of providing access to the resources in their collections, often they also provide access to photocopiers or provide copying services to better serve their communities. The Great Library at Osgood Hall in Toronto is a reference and research library with a large collection of legal materials. This library is maintained and operated by the Law Society of Upper Canada. The Great Library offers a custom photocopying service for Law Society members and other authorized researchers, as well as maintaining self-service copiers for the use of its patrons. CCH Canadian Limited is a publisher of legal materials, and in 1993, along with a number of other publishers of similar materials, it commenced an action against the Law Society, claiming that the Law Society had infringed copyright when the Great Library had reproduced copies of excerpts from their works. After the case had been heard by both the Federal Court Trial Division and later the Federal Court of Appeal, the matter came before the Supreme Court of Canada in November 2003. The key issues to be answered in this case are, did the Law Society breach copyright by maintaining self-service photocopiers that allowed copies to be made of the publisher's works at the Great Library? Did the Law Society breach copyright by providing its custom photocopying service? And were the Law Society's dealings with the publisher's work fair dealing under Section 29 of the Copyright Act? The Law Society maintains self-service photocopiers for use by its patrons in the Great Library. The patrons' use of the machines is not monitored directly. Since the mid-1980s, the Law Society has posted a notice above each machine indicating that the library is not responsible for infringing copies made by users of those machines. The court pointed out that no evidence had been presented that the self-service photocopiers had been used in a manner that was not consistent with copyright law. It disagreed with the Court of Appeals findings that posting the notice above the copiers was an acknowledgement that the photocopiers would be used for unlawful copying. The court held that even if there were evidence that the photocopiers had been used to infringe copyright, the Law Society lacked sufficient control over the patrons to conclude it had sanctioned or approved the infringement. Therefore, the court concluded, the evidence does not establish that the Law Society authorized copyright infringement by providing self-service photocopiers along with copies of the respondent publisher's works for use by patrons of the Great Library. The Great Library also provides a custom photocopy service. Upon receiving a request from a lawyer, student, or other authorized researcher, the Great Library staff photocopies extracts from legal materials within its collection and sends it to the requester. Does this service fall within the Fair Dealing Defense under Section 29 of the Copyright Act? The Fair Dealing exception, like other exceptions in the Copyright Act, is a user's right. The court reaffirmed that, in order to maintain the proper balance between the rights of a copyright owner and the user's interests, it must not be interpreted restrictively. The court made clear that research must be given a large and liberal interpretation. The Court agreed with the Court of Appeal that research is not limited to non-commercial or private contexts, and that lawyers carrying on the business of law for profit are conducting research within the meaning of Section 29. The Copyright Act does not define what will be fair. Whether something is fair is a question of fact and depends on the facts of each case. Following the Court of Appeal, the Court agreed that there is no set test for fairness and outlined six factors that could be considered to help assess whether a dealing is fair. Although these considerations will not all arise in every case of fair dealing, this list of factors provides a useful analytical framework to govern determinations of fairness. The court made it clear that allowable purposes should not be given a restrictive interpretation or this could result in the undue restriction of users' rights. However, some dealings, even if for an allowable purpose, may be more or less fair than others. For example, research done for commercial purposes may not be as fair as research done for charitable purposes. Are multiple copies of works being widely distributed? If so, this will tend to be unfair. However, if a single copy of a work is used for a specific legitimate purpose, it is more likely to be fair dealing. The court also noted the relevance of the custom or practice in a particular trade or industry to determine whether or not the character of the dealing is fair. The quantity of the work taken will not be determinative of fairness, but it can help in the determination. If there is a non-copyrighted equivalent of the work that could have been used instead of the copyrighted work, this should be considered by the court. One of the goals of copyright law is wider public dissemination of works. Therefore, if a work has not been published, but where that work is not confidential, the dealing may be more fair, as its reproduction with acknowledgement could lead to a wider public dissemination of the work. How likely is the reproduced work to compete with the original work in the market? The more likely, the less fair the dealing. 
While this effect of the dealing is an important factor, the court stated that it is neither the only factor nor the most important factor that a court must consider in deciding if the dealing is fair. The court indicated that these six factors may be more or less relevant to assessing the fairness of a dealing depending on the factual context of the allegedly infringing dealing. In some contexts, there may be other factors than those listed here that may help a court decide whether the dealing was fair. As for the facts of this case, the trial judge concluded that copying for the custom photocopy service was not for the purpose of either research or study, and therefore could not be fair dealing. The Court of Appeal held that the Law Society could rely on the purposes of its patrons to prove that its dealings were fair. However, it concluded that there was not sufficient evidence to determine whether or not the dealings were fair. The court asked, is it incumbent on the Law Society to adduce evidence that every patron uses the material provided in a fair dealing manner, or can the Law Society rely on its general practice to establish fair dealing? Dealing, the court concluded, connotes not individual acts, but a practice or system. The Law Society's custom photocopying service is provided for the purpose of research, review, and private study. Given that there is no other purpose for the copying and that the Law Society's custom photocopy service is an integral part of the legal research process, it was held to be an allowable purpose under Section 29. The Great Library's access policy specifies that those requesting copies must identify the purpose of the request for these requests to be honored. Cases where there are concerns that a request is not for one of the legitimate purposes under the fair dealing exceptions are referred to the reference librarian. The court held that this policy provides reasonable safeguards that the materials are being used for the purpose of research and private study. The photocopying service makes a single copy available to an individual for a legitimate purpose, which tends towards fairness. The court stated, there is no evidence that the Law Society was disseminating multiple copies of works to multiple members of the legal profession. The access policy states that the Great Library will typically honor requests for a copy of one case, one article, or one statutory reference. It further stipulates that the reference librarian will review requests for a copy of more than 5% of a secondary source and that such requests may be refused. This suggests that the Law Society's dealings with the publisher's works are fair. 20% of the requesters to the custom photocopying service live outside the Toronto area, and it would be burdensome to expect them to travel to the city each time they needed a specific legal source. Therefore, it is not apparent that there are reasonable alternatives to the custom photocopy service employed by the Great Library. As a general point regarding alternatives to the dealing, the court made it clear that the availability of a license is not required for a determination of fairness. The court found that it is generally in the public interest that access to judicial decisions and other legal resources not be unjustifiably restrained. No evidence was offered of any adverse market impact on the publisher's work as a result of the copying. Having applied the six-factor test, the court concluded that on these facts, the Law Society's dealings with the publisher's work satisfy the fair dealing defense and that the Law Society does not infringe copyright. The court allowed the appeal and issued a declaration that the Law Society does not infringe copyright when a single copy of a reported decision, case summary, statute, regulation, or limited selection of text from a treatise is made by the Great Library in accordance with its access policy. It also issued a declaration that the Law Society does not authorize copyright infringement by maintaining a photocopier in the Great Library and posting a notice warning that it will not be responsible for any copies made in infringement of copyright. The CCH case is most significant for clarifying how to make a determination of fair dealing and endorsing the two-stage approach and the six-factor test for fairness. It is also important for its emphasis on a large and liberal interpretation of the purposes under fair dealing, as well as confirming that the library can act on behalf of its patrons to serve the purposes of those patrons, and for an organization to rely on general practice rather than each individual instance to establish fair dealing. The six-factor test first appeared as part of the CCH case and has been used many times since to assist in establishing the fairness of a dealing. You should now be able to recount the circumstances and outcome of the CCH case, describe the role of fair dealing in the CCH case, and explain the use and interpretation of the CCH six-factor test. This has been the University of Alberta's opening up copyright instructional module on the CCH case. Thank you for your attention.